I'm going to sing for you, <clears throat> Sybil and I are this morning, a song entitled, You Are God Alone. Uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean, I think, made this more popular than anyone else, but uh, if you listen closely to the words, we many times become dependent on the things that uh, we have around us to uh, support us, and uh, we depend on this building to be here, we depend on uh, people to be here. We depend on, uh, we thought this morning we might not have uh, anybody to do the slides because we were afraid she was going to be sick, but she was here, thank God. But we depend on these things. And God tries to remind us sometimes by telling us that we're not going to have these things or it appearing that we won't, that he is in control, that he is sovereign. And it really doesn't matter whether we have any of these things because he is God and he is God alone and we need to trust him. So listen carefully to these words. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need.
scripture passage this morning is taken from Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 1 through 2. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 2. And I'll be reading from the message translation. Verse 1, Jesus then left the temple. As he walked away, his disciples pointed out how very impressive the temple architecture was. Jesus said, you're not impressed by all this sheer size, are you? The truth of the matter is that there is not a stone in that building that is not going to end up in a pile of rubble. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a faithful and holy God, that you are trustworthy, and that you're not dependent on anything that we do or don't do. But your faithfulness is part of who you are, is your nature. And we praise you for that. We praise you that we can depend on you and we can fully trust you. And we pray, Father, this morning, if there is someone here today that does not know that, that does not understand that, doesn't know the truth, that they will see the truth and hear the truth this morning in all of us, and that we will be the church, and we will love as you have loved us. And we give you praise and honor and glory for all that we do and all that you do through us. And we give you praise and glory for your power and your might and who you are. In Christ I pray. Henry Ford was born on a Michigan farm on July 30th, 1863. His mansion, his famous mansion, Fairlane, which by the way they named a car, a Ford car was named after Henry Ford's house. Fairlane is a master example of human resourcefulness. It has 56 rooms and covers 31,000 square feet. It originally sat on 1,300 acres of land and even had its own electric plant on the River Rogue to provide electricity for the entire state and then enough backup electricity in case of emergency for the surrounding communities and cities. Five different architects worked on Fairlane, including world-famous Frank Lloyd Wright. Fairlane was completed in 1916 at a cost of, in 1916 dollars, Two million four hundred and twenty thousand dollars. During a storm on April the seventh, nineteen forty-seven, the power plant flooded. The supply of electricity was cut off, and the lights went out. For the first time in the thirty-one-year history of Fairlane. April 7, 1947, just also happened to be the day that Henry Ford died. At the time of his death, Henry Ford was, had a personal fortune, a personal fortune valued at $700 million, 1947 dollars. In today's dollars, we're talking $200 billion. Yet he left this world the same way that he entered it 84 years earlier in a dark house lit only by candles. In the end, the majesty of man 
will be eclipsed by the power of God. In the previous passage, Jesus spoke the last words he would ever speak from the temple. And he did so with a broken heart. So this week we find that that as Jesus and his disciples were leaving, his disciples marveled. Just stopped for a moment and marveled at the incredible size, the massiveness of the temple. And Jesus said it would be utterly destroyed. What seems unthinkable to us is, is nothing to God. So what can we learn about the limits of man and the sovereignty of God, the power of God, from this passage this morning. We're going to look at two truths about those two things in our time together this morning. First of all, let's look at impressive structures. Impressive structures. Verse 1, this is from the New King James. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, it's Tuesday of Holy Week. In just four days, Jesus would be crucified on a cross. In just six days, he would rise to new life. The week of Holy Week is creeping along in Matthew's Gospel story. And the Bible tells us here that Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple. They didn't know it. He did. For the last time. The temple was always the focal point. That goes in your outline. The focal point for the city of Jerusalem. Now let's let's look at the history of the temple. Solomon built the first temple. It was an absolutely amazing structure. That is until it was totally destroyed by the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. In 520 B.C., the Persians allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. That temple was known as Zerubbabel's temple. It was named after the king of Israel when it was built. Zerubbabel's temple was was badly damaged, nearly destroyed by the Syrians in the 2nd century B.C. and was restored a few years later by Judas Maccabeus. Then in 21 B.C., the Roman governor Herod began an expansion of the temple that took 80 years to complete. This was the temple that Jesus visited during his earthly ministry. It was considered to be one of the great architectural wonders of the ancient world. By the time it was finished, Herod's temple covered one-sixth of the area of Jerusalem. This was a massive temple. It was an absolutely amazing structure. It was made of massive marble stones. We know that at least one of those stones was 67 feet long, 9 feet high, and and 7.5 feet wide. Imagine. That's a huge rock. A stone that large would weigh over 600 tons. Solomon's porch One of the porches running the length of the court of the Gentiles was 1,562 feet long. The royal porch on the narrow end of the temple was 922 feet long and was supported by 160 marble columns. Many of those columns overlaid with solid gold. It was a marvelous, marvelous building. So get the picture, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple, one of them looked back at that incredible building and was amazed at its size. What seems amazing to us might just be nothing to God. Well, secondly, let's look at temporal excitement. Temporal excitement, look at verse 2. 
And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Look at, look at the next phrase. Assuredly, I say to you, we know when Jesus says that, he means you better pay attention to what I'm about to say. Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. What an interesting thing to say. In response to his, to his disciples' comment regarding the magnitude of the temple, Jesus said, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. The disciples would have been shocked by what Jesus said. The idea that this massive temple would be completely destroyed would have been unimaginable, unthinkable to them. I mean, they had been working on it for their whole lives, for as long as they'd been alive. When they were little boys, they were working on the temple. They'd been working on it 50 years, and there were still scaffolding. Workmen would still work on it. They would, it would be 30 more years before it would be completed. It was the largest man-made structure any of these disciples had ever seen. But Jesus was making a prophetic statement. Matthew chapters 24 and 25 are known as what we call the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is also recorded in Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21. It's Jesus' most prophetic teaching in the Gospels. We're going to be looking at prophecy in the weeks to come. The theological word for the teaching of end times is eschatology. And everyone has an eschatology, whether we realize it or not. We all have a way of viewing end times. For instance, I believe Jesus Christ is coming again. Because he said he was. That's eschatology. And you have a belief whether or not he's coming again. And that belief is your eschatology. And most believers believe, especially serious Bible students, that their eschatology is the right eschatology. And they'll be happy to tell you that their view is the right view. Some Christians can tell you all about their eschatology, but they can rarely share with you the last time they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone that was lost. I, let me tell you what. I would much rather hear about how someone led someone to faith in Jesus Christ than I would about personal convictions concerning prophecy. Because I can promise you this. There's not going to be an award ceremony in heaven where Jesus says, Okay, I want to recognize Barry Jimerson because he got closest to the date when I would return. His eschatology was, was, was just about spot on. That ain't happening. There's not going to be a, an award passed out for who got closest to guessing when the Lord Jesus returns. Our ideas about prophecy are not nearly as important as our testimony to the lost. Now, with that said, prophecy is important. How do we know it's important? Because Jesus devoted two chapters in Matthew's gospel to it. It's important. He devoted at least one chapter each in the other two synoptic gospels, Mark and Luke, to prophecy. Let me say this as well. If you can't support your eschatology, your believings on prophecy, with the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse, you need to rethink your eschatology. You need to rethink it. 
My conviction is that our understanding of prophecy should be built upon those red letters, the teachings of Jesus, and other scriptures should go to support them. But Jesus wasn't the only person to prophesy about the destruction of the temple. Jeremiah prophesied about the destruction of Solomon's temple, and then a few years later, his prophecy came to fulfillment at the hands of the Babylonians. The important thing here is why. Why would Jeremiah make that prophecy? Why would Jesus say what he said there in verse 2? Well, Solomon's temple was destroyed because the people turned their backs to God. That's the same reason Herod's temple was destroyed. The people turned their backs to God. They rejected the Christ, God's only Son, our only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 70 A.D., only six years, isn't that ironic? They worked on this thing for 80 years, and they finished it, and they had a big celebration. And then only six years later, the Romans completely destroyed Herod's temple so completely destroyed it that no trace of it remains. As a matter of fact, the exact spot of every part of the temple is still disputed today. Now, some people will say, well, I know where it was. Well, not exactly. We don't know exactly where it was. Well, what about the Wailing Wall? Duh. It's on TV. The Wailing Wall wasn't part of the temple. The Wailing Wall is part of a wall that surrounded the temple, an outer wall. And to make matters worse for us, trying to figure out where exactly it said, as if that were important, because Jesus is saying here in verse 2, that's not important. What makes matters worse is where the temple once stood now stands something called the Dome of the Rock, Islam's second most holy site. Something that took 80 years to build took less than one year to utterly destroy. Do you know the same thing can be said about our relationships? What can take years, decades to build can be destroyed in a matter of minutes. Words can destroy. For example, we just got back this morning from a marriage retreat up at Flat Rock. Anybody ever seen the flat rock. Anyway, that just occurred to me. <laughs> but we just got back from a marriage retreat at Flat Rock. One of the things that married couples should never say, one of the words we should never say, is the word divorce. That word should not be in the vocabulary of a Christian marriage except in a very few rare examples. We've already looked at this in our study through the Gospel of Matthew. It shouldn't come up. Because once that word is used, it begins to destroy the marriage which is a sacred institution given by God. James says in James 3, beginning in verse 8, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. 
Sometimes our limited perspective, perspective of the world, sometimes our worldview leaves no room for God. Sometimes our limited perspective of, of the world leaves no room for God. The destruction of this massive temple would have been unthinkable for the disciples, but nothing for God. It's easy. It happens easy. It's easy to get our eyes off of God and on to ourselves. It's easy to get our eyes off of God and the truth of His Word and on to our own circumstances. They did that when they made that big ship that they called Titanic. Somebody said, a famous quote, I don't know, who knows if it was really said. Somebody said that somebody said, God himself couldn't sink that ship. It sank on its maiden voyage. First trip, it sank. It's easy to get our eyes off of God and on our own troubles. What about David and Goliath? Goliath seemed to be unbeatable. In the eyes of the Israelites, Goliath was too big. They had come across one fella that was just too big. David saw him through the eyes of God. David saw him as whipped. David saw him as a defeated foe. 1 Samuel 17, 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And that big boy was a big mistake. Because you're fixing to get a haircut right here. That's what David told him. Because he saw him through the eyes of God. David had yielded his life to God. And God defeated Goliath. Listen, did you hear that? Who killed Goliath? God did. <laughs> Through David. And God made a way where there was no way. What about the children of Israel when they were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army? I mean, they were doomed. They were done. They didn't have a chance. There is no way out. Yet God made a way where there was no way. What about when Elijah faced the prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel? Elijah was outnumbered 850 to 1. Yet God gave Elijah the victory. And God made a way where there was no way. What about when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that fiery furnace. They were as good as, God, as, good as dead. The Bible says that, that even, the, even the guards who threw them into the furnace, it was, it was so hot, it killed them. Yet not a hair on their head was singed. God gave them the victory. God made a way where there was no way. What about when the disciples lost their leader? which was about to happen. Jesus had been crucified. Yet on the third day, God gave them the victory. God made a way where there was no way. Do you believe any of those stories? You see, you see, personally, I believe all of them. And many other ones that I didn't mention that I could have mentioned. I believe the Bible is true. I believe it's the Word of God. I believe God did rescue the Israelites from Goliath and the Philistines through David. I believe God did rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I believe God did rescue Daniel from the lion's den. I believe God does make a way where there is no way. So what is it in your life this morning that is insurmountable. Come on, there's something. We're all facing something in our lives that's, that's just 
insurmountable. What is the one thing that God can't handle? What is the one thing that, that, that we've come across in our lives that, that God can't handle? God can't pay our bills. God can't heal our disease. God can't fix our marriage. What is it that God can't fix? Looks to me like from the Bible, he can fix anything. So what is it in your life and in my life that we've come across? Think about that. In all human history, all the people that's ever lived, we finally found the one thing that stumps God. I don't think so. I think God can do anything God wants to do. I think God can do the impossible. But we find ourselves in situations and circumstances and we have no idea what to do. There's no way out. What I want to remind you this morning, God's on the same throne this morning that he was on when he spoke all creation into existence. God's on the same throne when he rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from that fiery furnace. He's on the same throne. Jesus, the Bible says, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm, I'm here to remind you, to remind us, that God is still in the business of making a way where there is no way. You see, here's what happens. We get caught up in the excitement of the present. And we get, we get discouraged because we walk by sight and we have no faith and we get defeated and we can see no way out. That's why Jesus, that's why God gave us passages like Matthew 6, and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Some of us are worry worts, because we think we've come into something, and we've, we've finally turned over a rock that God can't fix. And we're worry worts. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. We worry because we lean on our own understanding. Because we can't figure the solution out. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. The tennis shoe company says it better than we can say it. Just do it. Just, just do it. Just do the godly thing. Just do the right thing in God's eyes. Just do the godly thing and trust God for the results. And you say, I know, I hear you. Hey, preacher, it's not that easy. You don't know my situation. You don't know my circumstances. It's not that easy. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. It's just that easy. It's not God that's making it complicated. It's us. It's really simple. It's really, really simple. Just do that which pleases God and trust God for the details. Just do that which pleases God and trust God to make a way where there is no way. Because sometimes we forget who we're dealing with. God is God Almighty. There is nothing my God can't do. And He's still in control of all things all the time. Well, have you been watching the news? Our country is in so much trouble. We're not going to make it. We just had a new president. 
then we'd be all right. That's how we think. If we could just vote differently, if we could just work harder, everything would be all right. No. If we would just surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then everything would be all right. Look, if, if your God is something you take down off the shelf when you get in over your head, when you get in trouble, then you need to throw that false God in a trash can this morning. And I'll introduce you to the real God, the God of the Bible, the God who rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And let me say, by the way, for every Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there are a hundred million he didn't rescue. That's why we pray for the persecuted church. More Christians have been persecuted, put to death for their faith in the Lord Jesus in the last hundred years than combined all throughout history. But if you'll read that passage about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, you know what, Nebuchadnezzar? They called him Neb for short. <laughs> you know what, king? You can do what you want to do. You can, you, you can throw us in the fiery furnace. But let me tell you, let us tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to bow our knee to that furnace. If you read that passage, you'll find they said, God may rescue us. He may not. We can only do what we can do. And we're going to trust the Lord. And God rescued them. Why? For his glory. For his glory. Here, here we are still talking about it. For his glory. If your God is something that you take down off the shelf, when you get it over your head, you need to throw that false God into the trash and get the real one. You need to allow me to introduce to you my God. My God can do all things. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples saw an amazing, a massive building, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Yet Jesus saw the destruction of a prideful human accomplishment. The most impressive temples in the world are not made with stones and mortar. The most impressive temples are made in the image of God. So the question is, what kind of temple are you? Are you a temple that God can use to bring glory to his name? That was the purpose for Herod's temple. Are you a temple that leads on their own understanding? Let's pray. Father. We need you. Some of us this morning, Lord, are, are struggling with faith. We're worried over one thing or another. We believe that you did all these wonderful things in history but we doubt you can deliver us. God, help our unbelief that we may believe. Speak to us, dear Lord. We pray as you do that you will have tender mercy on us right now and that you would open our eyes to truth, that we might begin to put our hope, our attention, our focus on the things of God that are true.
and remove our attention and not give one more moment to the world, to the temporal that tempts us to worry and to doubt your faithfulness. Lord, we're beginning to live in challenging times, even here in the U.S. God, we need you more than ever. So have mercy on us. Come visit our hearts, even right now, that you might build new temples, that you might receive glory and worship and honor through us, your church. In Jesus we pray, amen, amen. You're here today and there's never been a time in your life when you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You need to do that more than you need to do anything else. Come and give your life to the Lord Jesus. Maybe you're a worrier. All worriers wish they didn't worry. Maybe you just need to come and lay it on the altar. Give it to the Lord. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Either that's true or it's not. We need to decide this morning whether for us, as for me and my house, is that true or not? Maybe God is calling you to rededicate your life. Maybe you do. Maybe you know you belong to the Lord Jesus. But it's just so easy and happens so often, even daily, that your eyes get taken off of the truth of God drifted on to the world, the scary things of the world. Repent of that. Turn to the Lord. However God is speaking, and I know he's speaking, you just come. If you need to come and pray with me, you're welcome. If you need to come and pray at the altar, you're welcome. If you need to pray right where you are, you do that. But don't leave here today without yielding to what God's calling us to do. Let's be honest. Let's be open with the Lord today and with one another. Richard, come and lead us in an invitation hymn. Would you please stand?